Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the In the Eleven podcast. I'm your host, Brendan Griffiths, and this is the show where we bring on those from the world of football to show you what it takes to be in the Eleven at the highest possible level. This week's guest, very special guest, Rashida Beal, is stepping into the Eleven, former Champions League player, now in her third season in the Turkish Premier League. We discuss her career, how she made her way to Turkey, and she has a really interesting story of how she progressed her way into the professional game faced with a lot of adversity, a lot of times when many others would think about quitting, but not her. So it's a tremendous story of overcoming adversity and and can't wait to share it with you guys. So I want to get it over to our conversation quickly, but just one order of business to attend to before we do that. We've really been making a push on a lot of the content, as I'm sure many of you have seen over our different social platforms. And I really have to ask you whether you are already watching this on YouTube and you are subscribed, thank you very much. Or if you are currently listening to this on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, wherever you may be consuming this episode right now, do me a big favor, please, please, please head on over to YouTube, click that subscribe button. It helps the channel, it helps the show, it helps the episodes grow massively. You don't know how much I appreciate it. I can't thank you enough for if you would just kindly go over and do that quickly on YouTube. In the 11, hit subscribe. Thank you so much. And without any further ado, here's myself, Rashida. now from Turkey is Rashida Beal. First of all, Rashida, thank you so much for taking some time. I know the season just kicked off for you, um, but so excited to hear your story. So excited to talk about your journey in football. And uh, and again, thank you for, for taking some time out of your season. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to talking more about it. And it's always interesting to hear different people's like journeys and paths. So hopefully it can help somebody out. Absolutely. So right now uh, in Turkey, season just kicked off. Also, I know you mentioned that you had a kind of preseason training camp. If you kind of want to update the people so far on how everything has gone so far in preseason and training camp, like how kind of the initial phase of the season is starting to look both for you personally and for the team. Yeah, so for a little background, this is technically the beginning of my third season here. I have played a half season and then a full season and then starting a season. So um, I will say that every year it is really elevating the level here. So it's a big difference, like season to season, um, the quality of the other teams and just the league in general. So it's going to be very tough this year. Um, It's the first year where it's been like one bigger group and you play everybody twice. Uh, Previously, it was like two groups. So it's going to be really tough and really competitive. Um, Preseason camp is always a little bit difficult, especially when we started it like the day after landing here. (laughs) So that was a little hard, but um, uh, the first game, unfortunately, didn't go our way. We did have far more opportunities, but we didn't put one in the back. And basically the one shot they had on goal was a goal. So it was one of those games that just like didn't go the way you wanted to, but um. It was definitely nice to get like a first look at the the team kind of all together in a real game setting. So hopefully we can kind of build off of that and uh, take care of the next game this upcoming weekend. Hmm. And as you said there, your third year in Turkey and each year the league or just the football kind of around you seeming to got in better and better. What have you noticed have been some of those improvements or what do you think would point to each year the league becoming more competitive? So honestly, it's just been the kind of federation and also the clubs buying into it more like they're putting a lot more money behind various clubs and like really trying to elevate like the things to be more similar to the men. So like even doing like a longer training camp this year, 10 days instead of like six days and um, just sort of the conditions of the teams. A lot of teams are putting more money. And along with that, the foreign player restrictions have increased. So there's like more foreign players on the field at the same time so at this point you can have seven foreign players on the field and three on the bench so total 10 on your team which is a lot more than a lot of other leagues and so that's one of the ways that they're trying to kind of offset um the fact that up to this point the development of like the youth programs hasn't been as strong so they're allowing teams to bring in a lot more foreign talent and um, a lot of teams are investing a lot more that way so you're just 
you know, playing against a lot of really talented players from all over, not just uh, Turkish players. Um, so I really do think mm. that that's made a difference as well as just kind of the general investment um, in the league and in the sport in this country. It's increased each each season. Yeah. And I'm sure that has to be rewarding for you, especially, like you said, being there for a couple of seasons now and seeing it improve each year and see, you know, each year you come back, the level is higher and there seems to be more investment, whether it's in your club or just in the, you know, all the clubs around the league. I'm sure that has to be kind of a motivating factor for you to still want to keep playing here and pushing on. Right. Yeah, it's definitely like good to see. Um, I've seen it in I still like follow my old club from Romania and I've seen even the league there is really increasing um, and improving and getting a little bit more professional. So it's really good to see that all around, but it definitely like makes things more exciting for me here. Um, and it's pretty cool. Like when you get in a little earlier and then you're kind of part of that development process. So yeah, that's definitely been nice. Yeah. How do you think, uh, and just because this is kind of top of mind for me, living down here in Australia right now and, and we just had the World Cup, I was even able to catch some games uh, where I'm from in, in Perth. Um, do you think like that also just the, I mean, maybe talk to me about the excitement kind of around like just the, the game in general, also the Women's World Cup was, did, do you think that maybe also kind of add a factor into certain leagues, like really starting to invest more and more and then trying to make it, like you said, a bit more even and on par with what uh, federations and clubs do on the men's side. Yeah, so I will say even my first season here, I was pretty surprised by the like fandom of the women's soccer in this country. Um, like the men's games get really crazy. Like it, people are like diehard. And a lot of those fans for the bigger clubs like also are that way toward the women's teams. Like if you look at some of the top clubs here, the their Instagrams have like hundreds of thousands of followers. And so I was kind of like wow. surprised by that even initially. Um, and I just feel like that's like continued to grow here. But I do think that sort of the global improvement of things and excitement of things is like affecting a lot of countries because particularly, you know, Romania and Turkey, it's not places that you would necessarily think you would see that effect. But I definitely have seen it through there. So I do think sort of just the overall improvement and also just showing the game more and kind of promoting and posting it more i've noticed them yeah. and therefore like um various instagram pages that like promote the league here you know reference things in the world cup or or share other general like women's soccer news as well and so it's kind of that global community i feel like is also having a push and then that's definitely having an effect directly what i've seen here and in romania yeah and you, so you just mentioned there, you know, Romania as well. You had a stint there, obviously, a couple of years in Turkey. I know there's some time in Germany as well. But if we kind of take it back to be able to unpack all these different chapters of, of your story so far, can you talk to me about kind of where you grew up um, and a bit of your, you know, youth soccer career and what really made you fall in love with the game? Yeah, so I'm from Wisconsin, like the greater Milwaukee area. And um, that's where I've been you know, born and raised, whatever. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I actually talked with my parents about this when I was in college because we had to do some sort of like, what's your why type activity. Yeah. And I couldn't remember like why I started playing or what was the situation there. Cause I know a lot of people it's like, Oh, well my parents signed me up for five sports and like whatever the case. So I was like, Oh, like, why did you finally sign me up? And uh, my mom said, which this I remember she, she, played and she still plays just you know casually for fun but she always played like mm -hmm. when I was growing up in the local women's leagues and I would be like at a bunch of the games and I honestly don't remember like sitting and watching I remember just like playing with other kids and doing random stuff but I was like always around the game and she told me that eventually I think when I was like five or so I asked her like well when can I play so then she said oh okay you yeah. want to play like I'll sign you up and so I guess I asked to play and that's why I got signed up. And that was really the only sport I really like pursued throughout my youth time. I just didn't really have an interest in doing something else. And one year I did do track in middle school and I just felt like it was like taking away from my time to do soccer. And so I was like, I don't really want to do this either. So I just never really like pursued anything else and um, sort of grew 
in that environment. And I just have always been a very competitive person. So I always wanted to win and like be better and do better. So kind of late, but I ended up um, moving away from like my local club when I was like 13 and then into like one of the better teams in the state when I was like 15, it would have been so all through high school. So, yeah, I mean, one of the things I wish is that I would have done that sooner, but the environment around youth soccer was a lot different back then. Like people weren't, there yeah. wasn't like academy development and people weren't just like changing clubs and doing all this stuff that you see now. It kind of just was like, oh, you just play where you are. And some people got mm-hmm. luckier than others in terms of the environment and the coaching of their like local club. So, yeah, that was kind of the start of everything. Yeah, that, that's such a good point because I think it's like, uh, of course, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. But I think as you you go farther in the game and you get to kind of the senior level, you sort of understand that sometimes you have to make jumps to other clubs or to other environments to be able to get the best out of the training or get the best out of your career. And, you know, I'm sure I have kind of the same thought of like, oh, I was so much fun playing with my friends and being, you know, right close to home when I was growing up, but maybe if I had pushed myself outside of my comfort zone a little bit in my youth career, who knows what could have happened. Um, But does that competitiveness, does that kind of tie into your why as you get further along in the game when you start playing for the more competitive team and then also think about going to college at the highest level, does that kind of still motivate you as your why of, I just want to compete at the highest level and and division one college soccer is maybe the route that I can do that in. Yeah, like, uh, when I was getting to that, like, kind of later middle school time, I mean, that was sort of the the thing, like, that was the next, the next big step was, like, playing college. I honestly was not thinking past that, because there really wasn't a lot of options or a lot of, like, information about that. So, like, that was not on my mind at all. But I was like, yes, I want to play, you know, college soccer. And obviously, I had, like, D1 or, like, playing at the highest possible level on my, on my mind. And I was very, like, driven to do that. And I definitely think that, um, you know, changing to that club team allowed me to do that. If I would have stayed where I was, there's no way I could have played at the same level in college, just even sheer exposure wise, like I wouldn't have gotten that. So that was definitely the right step. But um, yeah, like University of Minnesota was what allowed me to do that. Like that was the highest level that I was ha- having an option at. And also like they have a good academic program as well. And especially in like areas I was interested in, like psychology So it just was kind of like the right fit overall, like everything lined up with that. And I really trusted my club coach as well. And he felt it was a really good option for me um, soccer wise. And it ended up being a very good, a very good choice. So yeah, when I, I got there, my freshman year was a little bit rough, which is like kind of a common (laughs) theme, but Mm -hmm. even for the first couple, I mean, after, during my freshman year, I was just worried about like getting on the field and like kind of earning my spot I was really struggling with my asthma and like a lot of things but then the next year my sophomore year I was like playing and starting all the games and so I was just worrying about being better and like you know being a good top player on the team I still wasn't really thinking about playing after until it was more so the summer between my sophomore and junior year and I played at the Seattle Sounders like at that time it was the W League team and like if you if I look back at that roster, like eighty five percent of the players play professionally after. But so like a lot of players there were like, Yeah, I'm gonna play after college and I was like, Really? Like, okay. And then I was starting to think like, Oh, maybe I could do that and like what is what would that look like and would that be worth it? And like I was starting to think those things and then it was kinda going through my junior year when I was really excelling that I was like, Yeah, I'm not gonna be done after my senior year. Like I'm yeah. gonna be done after college. That's not enough. Um And then after that, things did not go as I wanted, but kind of dealing with some injuries after college, it put into perspective for me what I, what I did want and didn't want. So like, I think I was put in a situation where it would have been easy to quit and say, you know, it just didn't work out and I, okay, like move on to this. But that was what made it clear to me, like, nope, I'm going to do it and I can do it. And I will is being put in a situation where it was like not going well or not being easy. Yeah, it's, it's funny how those moments of adversity kind of really test you and make you decide what it is that you want. And it sounds like maybe even one of the first ones that was that freshman year. And I'm curious to hear about, you know, maybe if you were advising a younger player who was coming up in a similar type situation, whether it's they're going to 
college or they're going to, you know, a new club team or whatever, if, if they're kind of the new one entering the environment, how do you, how do you kind of deal with all of those new things that you're trying to face and assimilating into a team, trying to fight for your own minutes, um, adjusting to all these different things? How are you able to maybe, if you look back at your freshman year, what are some of the things that you think that you did well to kind of fit into the team or maybe things that you would do differently if you had the opportunity again? Yeah, well, first I would say like the first thing is that everybody's like kind of path is going to be different. And so I don't think it's a fair idea to think that everyone can just come in and like play their freshman year and whatever, especially like coming in as a defender is a lot different than coming in as an attacking player. It's very hard to be yeah. like starting as a center back as your freshman year. So I, I think there's like sometimes perspective that you need to have of like that that is normal. And like if I look at, you know, me versus some of my other classmates, like what was hard for me is that the other top recruits were playing right away and I wasn't really. But if you look at the trajectory of our careers, like, you know, the growth was just different. So just because, you know, you come in and it's not going like as you wish right away, that doesn't mean that that's like you know, where you're stuck, you, you just may have more of like a, that kind of growth versus like kind of starting up there and more like kind of staying there. So yeah. there's just like differences in everybody's path. And also you really got to consider positions and just a lot of factors. So I do think that that's one thing is to not be like panicking. If like, you know, a lot of players come in, like being one of the best top, like two or three players on their club team, even on a club team that was like best in their state or like one of the top in the region and then aren't like doing as well their freshman year, that is like normal because most of the people who are there were also the top in their club team. So like every time you go up a level, you're around other people who are also like at the top. So like it, it just gets harder. So I think that that's one thing to remember. Hmm. But another thing that I sort of wish I did a little differently is like, really understand how big of a jump it was going to be because I just feel like I could have pushed things a little more in the summer but like I don't it's hard to even have a concept of the, the difference in the physical level between like club and college soccer until you're in it but like when they're telling you it's going to be one way it is going to be like that so just like it's a really big <laughs> jump physically and I think people underestimate that because that is partially like the style the U.S. style it's like college soccer is so yeah. reliant on like um, fitness and, you know, lifting and like a really physical aspect of the game. And the thing is, it's not just that you're doing those things is that they care a lot about fitness. Like they, the coaches prioritize yeah. that they care about that. And so like whatever, right or wrong, that's something to be like aware of and it, that, that jump is very big. So trying to like really mm. push that aspect in the summer, I think could help a little bit is there like a kind of welcome to college soccer moment that you can think of when whether it comes to like a fitness test or or just the physicality of the game in general that kind of comes to mind when you think about some of those early years coming into minnesota like i you know hear stories every program kind of does it differently but i'm wondering if there was kind of like an insane fitness test or something that everyone has to go through yeah so like I will say that each year they sort of like improve the, I guess, sports science aspect. Whereas like my first year, I felt like it was just kind of over the top with the like fitness and the running and the that and without a lot of like backing. Whereas once they started, you know, implementing the heart rate monitors and a little bit more on the strength and conditioning side, like, I mean, it was not easy by any means, but it was a lot smarter toward the end, you know, like. A little bit more yeah. individualized whereas in the beginning it was just like very generic and very extreme and so like my freshman year I guess there was two things one the like first day when it's like we had to do that year we had to do two fitness tests and I, I think it was like day one we did one and then the next day we did the other one but I can't exactly remember and like those were horrible and then we also had like technical tests and this point being, I failed all the tests. So because of that, I had to do 30 minutes of extra conditioning and 30 minutes of extra technical training before the 8 a.m. team training. And then they would oh be like God. yelling at us during the team training that we shouldn't be tired, even though we literally trained for a full hour before that. 
<laughs> so yeah, that was one of them. Cause I was like, terrified. that's ridiculous. And another one would have been <laughs> in the spring, which like, if people haven't played college soccer yet, like the spring is far worse than the season because you don't have games. Like after the season, you really don't have real games for nine months. So then that's a great time to just basically run, lift, whatever. And yeah. especially when you come back from like winter break, you can't even barely be on the ball with the coaches and like you don't have games for a couple months. So point being, it was one of the it was actually during the time when we had 20 hours a week to train. So it was more normal, like daily training. But every Monday was like fitness Monday or I forgot what they called it. Competition Monday. And it was like no matter what the drill was, it was a co competition. And if you lost, you had to run and it would like pile up throughout the practice. So if you lost the first drill, like you're basically screwed because you'd have to run. And then when you do the second drill, you're already like tired. And then, you know, that's yeah. just how it goes. And so, and it would be like uh two minute one V one, like where you're in a box for two minutes. And like, that just was not working for me. Like it, that was like an immediate asthma attack every single time. And I remember one time them being like, well, if you can't do this for two minutes, how are you going to play 90 minutes in the game? And I was like, when am I going to be doing a two, a one V one for two minutes? And when I win the ball, I'll put it somewhere yeah. else. Like not start dribbling. And so like, that was just kind of the mentality, especially my freshman year. And it got really cutthroat. Cause it was like, even if we're doing a passing drill, if I take it, if it's supposed to be right foot and I touch it with my left foot, now we've lost a point or whatever, or we don't count that pass. And that's putting our whole group behind. And if we lose, now we have to run. So people were being really like cutthroat, like no tolerance for mistakes because like your mistake could result in them running. And so it was just very like that was the environment my freshman year and the vibe. And um, yeah, that was a big difference from club stuff. Yeah. When you look at that environment versus maybe other environments that you've been in, I, I guess my, my question is, does that, how much does that help and how much does it hurt, right? Like where's kind of the balance between, yes, you still want training to be competitive, but there is a point where sometimes I think it goes over the top and it can start to actually hurt the atmosphere that's around the training. Like, so as, maybe as you look at your freshman year, it sounds like that was perhaps a little bit different than the atmosphere in some of the other years that you were at Minnesota. But how do you kind of reflect on that as, a, as was it helpful to the overall vibe or the success of the team? I mean, I would say, like you said, there's kind of like a line or like a balance. And so just like comparing that to my experiences overseas, like I'll say in Turkey, we run like more than other, like we just ran yesterday, even though we played a game two days before that. And like, so like every week, the first training back, we do some sort of running. But the difference is that they're like, telling me control like relax like oh if you, like if I start to not be able to breathe like slow down like whatever you don't need to be running with so-and-so whereas in college they were like you need to make it back in 10 seconds like I'm literally not able to breathe and they're like you better get there da, da, da. like that's the difference so it's like you can actually do something similar but the mindset can be different which I feel like is more yeah. beneficial because if I'm just thinking about myself personally if I'm doing some sort of sprints if I'm trying to push to stay like at the same time with so-and-so and I'm then therefore having an asthma attack earlier and then I'm going to end up not being able to finish what I'm doing. If I just slow down a little bit and do it within a certain like range, I can like have to work, but manage my breathing and finish the entire thing. So what's more beneficial for me, like in terms of fitness and whatever else, like obviously me being able to finish the, the whole thing. And so like, just that is one example of like, Sometimes it's not even just what we were doing. It was like the way they were approaching it, including fitness tests was like people would throw up before the fitness test because they were so stressed and nervous. I don't think that that's beneficial. I think that's crossing a line no. to being just like, and part of it is, is that the college soccer is this weird viewpoint of like, it's about mindset and mental toughness. You can just will your way through the fitness test. And like, we're testing your, your yeah. mentality, not just your fitness. And I'm like, I don't think that that's very useful. <laughs> I think that crosses a line. At the same time, being overseas, I think other people see me that way because I definitely bring an American mentality to things where I'm like, he said two touch in the drill. Why are you taking three? Why are you taking four? You're not improving personally or improving our team by not following that rule. So like if you take three, it's a turnover. Yeah. Like if you like, that's the mentality I'm bringing.
So like, I think sometimes other people in other countries see me that way because I am bringing that background. But at the same time, I look back at college and I'm like, that was too much. Like that was crossing the line where, especially my freshman year, I think it was getting a little better, you know, throughout, but just the overall mindset of college soccer is very like intense and cutthroat. That's just how it is. And I think a certain kind of person excels in that. And so fortunately for the most part, I'm one of those people. So like, but for a lot of people, it ruins their love of the game and they don't play ever again after college. So it's, yeah. I don't know. There's, there are pros and cons. And I definitely think it does make you mentally stronger and like be able to endure a lot of just adversity and intensity. But at the same time, I feel like a lot of times it crossed the line. And I wouldn't even say my experience at Minnesota was anywhere near what I've heard from some other people in other programs. So yeah, that's just kind of a little bit of perspective based on comparing to some things now, I guess. No, it, it completely makes sense. And I think that that what you hit on there is is definitely the sad side of it in the sense that there are some players who kind of have that joy that they have for the game kind of taken away from them um, by the programs that they're a part of or by the coaching staffs that they're under because, you know, they're so excited to go and play the game at the college level and then the environment that they have, it just, it's so different than anything that they're used to. And it kind of becomes so disconnected even from the actual game itself that then they just lose that love for it and lose that joy. But you're right. There is it, like, there is a fine line because for some, it can kind of motivate and drive them to success and drive them to the top and others it can it kind of do the opposite. So it's like, a, it's just... I don't know. It's, it's, it seems like a very dangerous line to play. And, and it's, it's why it's, it's kind of maybe almost better to take it down just a notch because then it's like, you know, it, it, in the percent and that 1% of maybe that you get to one or two players to excel, like if you've just lost 10 players, like, because they don't even love the game anymore, you know, it's, it's almost like, is, is that worth it? What's the, what's the trade off there? Um, but for you, like you're talking about kind of that as you progress in that that career at Minnesota, like you go on to have success and it, it really is a driving and motivating factor for you. How do you kind of reflect on the remaining three years after you had that maybe shock period of, of your freshman year? How do you reflect on the remaining three years uh, as, a, as a college soccer player? I mean, I thought that each year, like I was growing personally, and then our team was also growing. Cause like, if you look statistically at it we improved each year and did much better like year over year so I mean I think we were growing I think part of it was that my class specifically was pretty strong and so we started off as freshmen and you know as we were growing that made a really big impact in the team and we were like pulling other people along with us who were younger um so like I mean I have like a good I don't know perspective or memories on it like it's more so after the fact being in other environments that I re reflected on some things like oh yeah that was pretty extreme <laughs> but yeah. uh, like at the time I don't know you just adapt you get used to it and like I you know figured out various things I had to do to be able to like adjust to the environment or excel in it and I mean our team improved each time I also think that like I said they started incorporating a lot more of the like sports science stuff where you know the strength and conditioning staff was monitoring our heart rates and like planning out training loads so like the coaches couldn't just do like wild things and they were like just monitoring things a little bit closer so that you know it was still hard it was still still obviously very you know fitness heavy or physical but it was a little bit better planned out and like a little bit more reasonable yeah. especially around a season and like you know developing an off season all that so I mean, all of that, I thought, improved. And, I mean, I also got faster and stronger every single semester that we, like, tested various things. So that was good to see as well. And I do, like, I really loved the actual, like, strengthening and lifting stuff we did. And I, like, thought it was really effective. I mean, it was hard. But I really liked that. And I think it was, it was definitely contributed to me improving throughout my time there. But, yeah, um, I would say a big thing was that my class was overall pretty strong and very competitive and like wanted to win. And mm -hmm. my, between my last two years, like my junior year, we started out really strong, but then we had like one bad game and then we could never like get back after that. And so the, my class and I together after that, we were like, that's not happening again. Like we're winning the big 10. 
And that was that we that was not an option. That was not like we want to win. We were like, we are not leaving here without a championship. And we were all bought into it. And I feel like that's what was the driving force because all of us united, you know, together being like, this is what we're doing. So everybody else needs to get on board or get out of the way. And that was the, you know, united yeah. front we had. And um, not only us, but also players who had been there the first year, they saw like what we could be versus like where we ended up based on kind of just like falling apart in big moments. And so that was like what we really pushed for. And like, we all committed to being there all summer. You know, I could have gone and played somewhere else in the summer again, but we were like, no, we're all going to stay here and like run the captain's practices and make sure that we're like setting ourselves up for that. And so, I mean, that was something we all like committed to together. You know, if I just did that alone, that wouldn't have mattered, but it was because it was like, you know, a core group of people saying like, this is what we're doing. This is not an option. And, you know, we did that. Mm -hmm. So obviously that played a role, but yeah, we were very clear on what we wanted. And by that time, you know, we had the experience. We also had the experience of like having something in your grasp and then losing it. And so, I mean, I do think that that lesson, it hurt a lot my junior year, but I do think that that lesson played a big role into like the success we had the next year. But yeah, so like overall, I felt each year, you know, improved individually as a team. And I mean, I ended up like really satisfied, really happy with my, my time there overall. When you look at that season, you, you talk about how the intention was so clear, right? And, and everyone kind of had this mentality that they bought into and in, in winning a championship and not leaving the program without a championship. And now that you had the opportunity to play in college and also at a number of different places, kind of at the professional level, is there things that are like kind of tangible that you can feel right when you're in an environment like, oh, this is a team that I think is going to be special or uh, this is a team that maybe is missing something and and maybe it's not something you can always put your finger on. But I'm just curious to know, like, you know, maybe when you walk into your team in Romania or, or in Turkey or something like that. Now, just noticing, like, oh, there's something about this team. I think that we're gonna do well. I mean, sort of, but I feel like the landscape is quite different overseas, where like there can just be such big disparities between teams sometimes that like you're not gonna be able to like will your way to winning. And so, like mm-hmm. in Romania, I was on like the Champions League team, a team that's won the league for like a decade, and you know, it wasn't that I felt like there was necessarily that component but like the team was just way better than other teams like so we could play horrible and still win the game like it was kind of that and that was one thing I did not like about my experience there is that it just was such a big disparity like talent wise um and what's yeah. what I'm seeing being different is that other teams are now investing more financially than that team so they're starting to attract some of those players or like players who were on that team then left and then are coming back to Romania, they're not going back to that team. They're going to other teams who are investing more like into the players. But at that time and, and throughout those 10 years, like that team just was, had better players. Like they just had more talent. So those other pieces weren't there as much as like, I would think, or as much as it seems more important in like college soccer. And then here I would say like, I'm on more of like a middle team. And I do think that again, is there's just such a big disparity in terms of the the resources that are that like Galatasaray has versus our team. It's a huge difference. Like every single aspect, housing, food, travel, like equipment, staffing, um, sort of like sports science elements, like all of that is completely different. And so then that makes a really big like difference overall. But also like something that I have been like kind of struggling with here is that I don't feel like there's a championship mindset and like it's something I'm trying to push but it just seems like people are a bit resistant to it and like I'm like how are you complacent with what's going on clearly it's not okay like I don't know how to explain it like because I'm quite intense especially anywhere training games whatever I'm quite intense and it's like my opinion is like no it's not about oh relax they call like we're not winning So something is missing. Like you need to not be okay with making those mistakes repeatedly. That's sort of like where my mindset or where I am at with things. And I just feel like other people are. And so that creates like, can create a bit of frustration on my end. 
Yeah, I, I think it's the most, it, it's probably the biggest jump, right, between college and the professional level is as soon as the finances start to come into play with it, it just, it, it very much unevens the playing field. And not to say that in college, like, I think as we all know, as we go through college, we understand that it's not necessarily always an even playing field at the college level either, because there's different programs that have different resources, and that's just a reality too. But man, it, it's like you have teams that do push and do want to perform at the best level, but they just can't afford to go out and pay the wages of the best players. And so they're always going to kind of lack a little bit in terms of talent. They're always going to be kind of stepping up in order to try and compete with those top level teams. And it's, it's something that just makes the game very interesting. I think at the next level, once you, you know, do have all of those things that include whether it's wages, whether it's staffing, whether it's sports science, all those kind of things. Um, but I do definitely want to kind of set the scene as to how you've made it to all these places. So you, so you finish your career at Minnesota and so kind of that junior senior years where you talked about how now you're like, I want to play at the next level. I don't want to be done once I graduate and have that diploma. I want there to be something after when you're in that senior year time, what's kind of your thought process about how you're going to do it? Are you thinking of Europe right away? Are you thinking of America right away? Or what's your mindset? So I was like in a position where I entered college with like over a semester's worth of credits. And then um, so when I was starting to think about that and I was looking at like kind of what I had left, I ended up deciding to graduate early. So like after my senior fall, like I graduated in December. And so for me, I didn't really need to do much to do that. I decided to take a couple summer classes um, since I was going to be there anyways. And then what that meant is that my senior fall, I only had 10 credits. So like I could have done it without the summer classes, but I would have had like a full load, like 16 credits. So I was like, well, I might as well like knock a couple out in the summer and then have like a really light um, senior fall. So like that's kind of what I did because I figured just opens up more opportunities and like what, what exactly was the point of being there in the spring when I could graduate mm -hmm. early. So uh, me and actually three other people in my class decided to do that. And so I graduated in December and then I decided to enter the, the draft, like figuring, well, at that time I was actually figuring that there could be a chance just based on the senior season I had, um, like finishing like first team, big 10 defender of the year, all American. So I was like, maybe I actually do have a chance of like being drafted. But, um, so I decided to like kind of pursue that first. So I entered the draft and I did get drafted mm -hmm. in the last, the fourth round to Kansas City, who we played in a friendly the spring before. So I ended up like going there for the preseason. And at that time, the rosters were only 20 players. So um, it was a lot different landscape than it is now. But regardless, I don't know that I was quite at that level. That was a huge difference and a huge jump. Uh, college soccer to like being in an environment with Becky Saar, Run, Sidney LaRue, y'all, Averbush, like players like that, that is a huge difference. So it was definitely a yeah. struggle, but it was more mental. Like I was just very anxious because it was like really the first time that I was actually like in a situation thinking I won't make this team. Like I could not make this team. If I may, may keep making these mistakes, like I won't make the roster, like that kind of thing. And I was just getting too in my head about it. So it, what ended up happening is that I did not make the 20 player roster, but I got offered like a reserve spot and they like paid for housing um and in that situation like so the reserves trained with the full team we had housing and um they helped us set up some things like with coaching or with um working different tournaments or things like that so like that's what i was doing and i was also dealing with like a tendonitis thing that ended up turning into a partial tear so it's really uh painful but I was still playing on it. And then eventually I had like a really serious family emergency come up. And so about halfway through the season, I decided to just go home. Cause I was like, I can't stay here dealing with this family thing when I'm not even like on the roster. So I decided to go home at that point. And that was the exact point where my other kind of people in my class who had come in as like rookies with me went overseas. So it was like in the July type transfer window so they all went overseas I went home so I'm very upset but I'm like well I need to reset my life a little bit so yeah then I went home 
I dealt with my tendonitis thing, dealt, you know, had some time with family. And then I was like progressing my training back. And so in the spring, I had an opportunity in Norway and basic, and I went with a girl who I had actually played with since my freshman year in high school. So we played all club high school together and then all college together. And then we were in Kansas City together. And then we had this opportunity together. So we went. And the long story short is we got kind of like screwed over where, you know, we had an offer, a contract offer. And they said, oh, we'll, we'll sign it when you get here. We'll do this thing, whatever. And then after three days, they were like, oh, we're not giving you guys a contract. And we were like, what? And so then we went to try out. This is the, this is when now when my series of unfortunate events begin. So I went to try out then <laughs> with another team in Norway, but we had to fly to Spain. We had to pay for ourselves to fly to Spain because they were in training camp. So we went and I was doing really well. And like, basically they had told me, oh yeah, if you play like that in our next friendly, like we'll sign you. And I pulled my hamstring. So then they're like, oh, we're not going to sign you. <laughs> so then I go home and then I go back to Minnesota to train like probably like two weeks later. It was just a minor hamstring pull, but whatever. So I go back to my old team in Minnesota and I'm doing like a training with them and in the last five minutes of the training somebody kicks me in the side of the knee while like all of my weight is on one leg so tears like my whole knee so basically it was a contact tear and it was my ACL and medial and lateral meniscus and my meniscus was pushed into my knee so like my knee was like bent like this and I couldn't straighten it so then I had to like stay in Minnesota for like a week until I could physically make it home by myself because I had driven there like it's five and a half hours so I stayed there for like a week drove home like the surgery was scheduled for a month later and then whatever so basically I had like a a clearly a year out um because my surgeon who I worked with has is one who likes I think Marquette sends some players to as well as like the box and so and she was like nine to twelve months and I was like are you sure and she's like yes so it was like a very difficult year. And it was in that year where it was like, that would have been so easy to just say, like, you know, never mind. And I was like, nope, I'm going to figure it out. So that's when I, I did a lot of coaching that year. And again, every time I was coaching, I was just thinking about how much I'd rather be playing than coaching. Um, yeah. I coached like youth teams. Like I had a U11 girls, U10 boys. And then I had, I coached, a D3 school so I was an assistant at Carroll and then I coached a high school team so I had like all of the variety and every single time I was like yes. I would just so much rather be playing but anyways um when I was finally coming back from that I had set up to go to a, a really strong WPSL team who had like recently won the national championship so I had like contacted that coach who I'd played against when I was a reserve in Kansas City and so I had that set up. I was just coming back, like whatever. And then my meniscus repair, one of them failed. So like they, at that first oh. surgery, they had like, you know, replaced my ACL and then they had repaired both my meniscus and with like eight stitches and five stitches, which is a lot for meniscus. Normally it's like two or three. So they, if there was a lot going on and one of the repairs just didn't work. Like it just didn't hold. Mm-hmm. And that's like, kind of annoyingly common with the meniscus because the blood flow is so poor and you know the surgeon has to make a decision whether they think that it can heal or not and so you know whenever possible they want to repair it like that's better long term but it just doesn't work out like 30 percent of the time so not like that's kind of a lot okay so my meniscus repair yeah. failed literally the week before i was supposed to leave for the summer team so i ended up still going because like the time it can take to come back from those is like really wildly varies. Like some people come back in four weeks, other times it's like three months. But the thing is I had just come back from like huge surgery. So like going in again, it really just shut my quad down. Like my knee was very unhappy, like swelling wise. And so I was, I was there just whatever, doing my rehab there and like, seeing if there was any way I could get back for any part of the season and like supporting the team and stuff. But that was really hard and I couldn't make it back. Like, I mean, those seasons are quite short and like, I just couldn't Mm -hmm. get back in that time. And which also meant that I basically missed the like summer window, summer transfer window. Yeah. Yeah. And so that took me about 
about three months to be like a hundred percent. So like between like eight to 10 weeks, I was like starting to work back, but it was about 12 weeks, three months before I was like, okay, I'm like back now. And so that was immediately after going through the basically year long recovery. Then I had that other surgery, another three months, all that. Then I'm like, at this time, I'm not working with an agent. I'm just like trying to message teams on my own. And I, I got in contact with like an American coach who was coaching a team in Portugal. And so like, that was looking mm-hmm. like it was going to work out. Like they literally sent me a contract. I signed it, all the stuff. And then it was everything. And then they're like, okay, we're just, he's like, I'm just waiting for them to get your flight. And then like, it keeps going on and on and on. And they're never getting the flight. And then all of a sudden they're like, well, we can't like, basically we can't afford it now. So like, maybe we'll talk in in January. And I was like, well, no, I'm not talking to you in January now after this. And so again, because of that, now I was screwed out of the like window still. And the only thing open was like Israel. And I was trying there. And I, again, I had a team that was really interested and they're like, we can't afford it. Like to basically to bring you or whatever. And so then I'm like (laughs) still home and still training and coaching and working and doing whatever. And then I started working with an agent because teams I were, was reaching out to were like, Oh, we only work with this agent. We only work with this agent, like different agents, but one of them reached out to me. So I ended up working with him for a while. And so then in the beginning of February, 2020 is when I got the option in Germany. And so finally I had a contract, whatever I'm, I go there it's like fairly normal for like a month and then like COVID happened. So Mm -hmm. we like don't have a season. So there was, I was there for four months, but for like over three months, we just were basically locked in our little uh, hotel and just training me and the other Americans were just like doing our, our own stuff like alone. Yeah. And so then I came back from that. And in that time, also a bunch of teams like lost money or shut down or whatever, because like sponsors dropped out all the way. What had happened to the team we were on was like sponsors dropped out. Cause they're like, well, you're not playing like that team ended up folding. So, um, it was really hard to, to find options after that because a lot of teams like didn't have money now to bring foreign players. So like, they didn't even know what was going on with their next season. Like, so then that was another like tough time. And so then it was like eight months again at home before I got my contract in Romania. And then it's been like, oh you know, God. we've been okay since then, but like, yeah. So it was like quite a few years where things were not going well. And yeah, I mean, I went through a lot of like ups and downs with that, but that, that as you can see, it wasn't just like one injury where I'm like, Oh, I have to, it was like one and then another and then like this team not working out and then COVID and then nothing for eight months. And it was like on and on and on with this. Probably like yeah. three full years of like, it was just like not going well and it being like, okay, I don't know. So like sometimes I try to, when I'm getting frustrated, I try to remind myself a little bit of perspective because there's a very mm-hmm. clearly a point in time when I thought I would never be in this situation again. Like, I would never be able to sign a team. I would never be in a season. I would never be playing, like, at the level that I wanted to. So, yeah. although there are, there are things I don't love about this team or this situation, and, like, you know what? To have a little, like, perspective for gratitude. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that you're, like, complacent, but I think that that is important in life in general. But, yeah, that's, like, my short version of college to now. Yeah. Yeah, so just to to make sure that I'm following, because I think what's so interesting about like as you talk about that story is kind of each individual event, you know, you know, and and I probably know a handful of players who have gone through that, and then that was the thing that made them stop, right? Like whether you know, I think as I'm following kind of along your story here, you know, two surgeries multiple contracts in Norway that get pulled out, Portugal contract in Norway, or excuse me, a Portugal contract that gets pulled out. Like also, you know, kind of dealing with things on the family side too, which I know is like also so difficult as well when you're trying to balance, like pursuing your professional life and then also kind of dealing with things that are going on at home as well. You finally get kind of what you feel like is the opportunity in Germany and 
then a global pandemic hits, you know, something that is completely outside of your control. And so I, I guess I, I have to ask, like, what is it that allows you to kind of remain steady in the mission and steady in the goal of knowing, knowing that there's going to be a light at the end of this tunnel and just keep doing the things that you need to do in order to try and get there? Because I think a lot of people would listen and they would say, all right, after a knee surgery that had a nine month, nine month plus recovery, and then having to go back under the knife again, that would be enough for me, right? Or having two contracts, three contracts right there, signed, sealed, practically delivered, and then something gets pulled out from under you. Like what was able to just keep you focused and determined in, in the game, I guess. So one thing I'll say is that some, some of it is just a personal quality and like, you know, I by no means think I'm like some amazing, amazing player or person, but one of my best qualities is my ability to be like very driven and determined on a, on a goal. So when I decided that's what I was going to do, that's what I was going to do. And now to me, that didn't mean that I just sat there and only trained. Like I had to work, I had to do other stuff, but I was training six days a week through every, all, every single aspect of those. I was training six days a week, uh, before my surgery, I took a week off and I couldn't move. And then I trained upper body. And then I had my surgery. I trained, like I was always yeah. doing those things because that's what I decided I was going to do. And so, yeah, I had to do, you know, it, it's hard when you have to like, also, you know, I was coaching, like I said, four different teams. Like I was also doing an online job. Um, and then I was having to just train alone a lot. Like that gets hard, but mm -hmm. part of it is just that I'm very, get very set on what I'm deciding to do. And it was kind of like each thing that wasn't working out was almost giving me a more of a fire to do it. Like, no, I refuse to accept this answer. Like this, like I refuse to accept like, oh, I just never worked out. I never got a contract and didn't really get to play after college. Like I just refused to accept that. There was, of course, moments where I felt that way or where I felt like just saying forget it or whatever else. But overall, it was that. And then I will say, like, one thing I really focused on, especially throughout my recovery, was making way smaller goals. So, like, literally, you know, like daily mm. to do this or whatever. And really focusing on them in a little bit of a different way. So, like, obviously, just for my example, for my surgery, obviously my... Portland? No, <laughs> my goal was to get back, like play professionally. That was my goal, right? But when I couldn't even walk on two legs, if I'm thinking about that, goal, I'm going to be pretty upset and like discouraged and like whatever. So yes, that was my overall goal, but I had to back it up. Like, okay, well, that means that, you know, right now I can't walk. So I want to be able to walk. Okay, well, I'm not going to be able to walk if my leg's swollen. And I can't bend it. So that means today I need to ice, you know, five times and I need to do my mobility range of motion things three times. And like, yeah, just, it was things like that, like really scaling it down to like, okay, this is my big goal, break that down and break it down, down, down into like daily things. And so it was like, I actually couldn't control TV if my knee swelling went away, but I can control if I'm icing, if I'm elevating, if I'm, you know, doing the things I was given. And that's where I would get, it was really hard sometimes is that I was doing every single thing to the T and not, it wasn't progressing how I wanted or how like it could, but it was like trying to detach a little bit, like the results from the actions uh, was a big part of everything. It's like, you know, I couldn't control these contract situations, but I could control, am I messaging 10 teams a day? Am I, you know, like doing my videos or like what? Cause I was getting filmed from like training with a local NAI team. I'm like, I'm, you know, kind of cut that myself, make my own film. So I was like doing the steps that I could do and I could control to put myself in the situations, whether that was throughout my recovery, like throughout trying to find a team, like anything. And so a big thing to like staying focused is, is like narrowing in on like, what do I need to do today? And um, mm. I would say that was like definitely one of the things that got me through. But another big thing was just having the mindset of like refusing to take no for an answer, refusing to accept, I guess, like a certain fate. And I do think a little bit of that is just kind of like 
natural personality driven, but yeah, that's, I guess, my opinion about it. No, I think that's, I think it's kind of that idea of being, you know, the captain of your own fate or the, you know, the master of your own destiny, right? And I think every kind of player who wants to pursue something like this has to adopt that mindset to a certain degree because there are going to be setbacks, just point blank. Every single player is going to deal with something. And and for you, you had, you know, injuries and contracts and for other players, it's going to be something completely different because they're going to be in a different situation. Kind of like you said before, no two paths for a player are going to be the same, but uh, the one thing that we can all kind of agree on is that it's not always going to be smooth sailing for you to get to the professional level or to stay at the professional level. So it kind of is like, it sounds to me like you just continue to be steadfast in no, I'm the, I'm the captain of this mission and it's not going to come down to whether somebody else or a different person is taking away from my ability to be able to get to the professional level. It's going to come down to me and only me am I going to decide when I'm done and when I don't want to pursue it anymore. Okay, that's kind of what I gather from that story. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what it is. And, I, and like I said, I do... So, like, looking back, in no way would I have, like, kept this injury if I could, but what I did is make the most of what I could. So, like, what I gained from that time was, like, definitely even greater resilience, but also I developed a career that I still do now here online, which I think allowed me to continue to learn longer than some people because I know, you know, for the vast majority of us, financially, it is not enough to, like, live a life in the U.S. So, yeah. A lot of people I know are like, I'm just not making enough money. That's not worth it. Da, da, da. Well, now for me, I'm like, do I have another job? And do I wish I could just do this and, you know, have all the money I need? Yeah, of course. But the reality is that that's not that right now. So I have another job. So then I don't feel pressure to stop playing because of finances or because like, oh, I have to live at home and I don't have a car and I don't have a house. I actually have all those things because I developed a career you know, like a remote career while I was home, while I was hurt, while I was, you know, pursuing other things. So then when the time comes and like, finally things are working out, I don't have to feel like I can't sustain it, you know, on that end of things, like financially or kind of like, you know, life setup wise. Like, I feel like, you know, I have all of my own things and I have things set up and like it, that in the end is going to allow me to play for longer. So, I mean, there's also just the kind of mentality of like, taking what you can from it and like so like I said you know during my time I was doing that I was also pursuing other things and making sure to develop my self I guess holistically and so then never losing sight of that that those goals and having that as a priority but at the same time realizing the reality of things and you know setting myself up for like kind of holistic success I feel like that definitely played a role yeah can you speak to, uh, you know, I know you just kind of talked about it there a little bit, the financial piece of it, but I think it's something that maybe some players out there wouldn't really quite comprehend. Like one is just, you kind of need money to do, to even go into this, to pursue this, right? Because you may get a call from a team and they want you to fly out to sign that contract or they want you to fly out to trial with them. And, you know, if you say to them, oh, well, I don't really have the money right now, but maybe in a couple months it might be, you know, there's the opportunity gone. And same thing, once you actually do sign that contract, it's very likely, especially in the beginning, that it's not going to be enough to really live off of. So you're going to have to make ends meet in other ways. Like, I know you mentioned there that that was going to be not something that was going to deter you from, from getting to your goal. But can you maybe just give a little bit of insight into a player out there who thinks, has a misconception of what the professional football finances kind of look like? Yeah, like, I would say the thing is, unless you're, you know, playing for literally a top club in the world, or like, you know, I know things are a lot better NWSL wise, but you have to realize like, you know, they say like 1% of people make it professional. Okay, so then playing anywhere professional, you're in that 1%. But the people who are making like sustainable money are like the 1% of that 1%. So like, yeah. You know, like I said, you can be an you know, American or whatever, and that doesn't mean you're going to be, you know, making like a livable wage even in the end of yourself. But point being, unless you're in the top clubs in the world, 
or one of the top players, period. Like, it's not money that you can pay bills in the U.S. with. Now, I, like, if you're just looking at your life in the other co- in the country you're in, it can depend. So, like, in Turkey, $1 is 25 lira. So, you know, even a salary that's, like, not enough to do anything with, that's, like, less than minimum wage, here, you have good money. Like, you, you can do anything you want here. But if you look at, like, oh, well, I want to, you know, I want to rent a place when I'm home, or, like, oh, I need to pay for my phone and my, like, insurance and groceries when I'm home, then it starts being like, no, you really don't have money for that because <laughs> it doesn't like go that far in the US. So depending on the country here, and if you go far there and like you can feel like you're fine there. But if you want to, if you look at like actually your overall life, it's, it's not enough to like live a life off of. And not to mention that at least like in every situation I've been in, you're not paid in the off season. Like, you're only paid during the months that you're there for, like, you know, season and season and whatever else. So you're not paid in the off-season either. So then that's, like, another factor to consider. Um, so just the reality becomes that you need to do other things. And especially if you want to play for any, like, amount of time. Uh, you know, if you're just out of college, you know, maybe for a year or two, that's fine. But, like, yeah, when you get to the point you're 27, 28, like, I personally did not want to still be at home and be, like, using my parents' car and like just be relying on my parents and be like but I play soccer professionally like to me that's not what I would want and then that that kind of environment would give me stress when things aren't working out because that's the other thing you don't know when you're gonna get contracts like even between seasons sometimes it's and other times it's like you're not finding something that lines up you're there for six months so like what kind of lifestyle yeah. do you want to live in that time and so for me I just know that I was still basically staying at home and like basically relying on my parents. I would start not enjoying that if I was home for any amount of significant time. So that was like a big push of me, like moving out at conveniently right before I got my contract in Romania. And I've been barely home since then, but that was a big push. Uh-huh. like, cause then, you know, whether or not it works out, whenever it works out, I'm at least, you know, doing what I want to on this end and feeling like independent on this side. And then it gave me a little bit more room to like breathe in terms of the soccer stuff instead of feeling like pressure that like, oh, it's not working out and I'm still doing this and I'm here. So like the reality is you got to do other stuff. I personally recommend trying to figure out remote work and things like that. But also like even when I'm home, I, I coach like private lessons and other stuff. But yeah, it's not like something you do because you want to be like <laughs> rich or like think it's going to mm. be sufficient income on its own of course there are cases where that that happens like on my summer league team the, the sounders team rose Lavelle was on the team and of course she was like yeah i'm gonna play after college like that's what i'm gonna do well yeah for her that make you know she's making <laughs> great money but like the reality is that most most people even you know players that were the top players in college that might not always be the case so yeah it's just something to be aware yeah. of it's not like a you know, rich and famous lifestyle it's like you're doing it because you, you, if you're going to be able to do it, it's because you have that just love for it or that need to get out your like competition side or whatever the case was because you have like a passion for the sport and playing it. And, you know, the time is, is so limited to play at that level. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you just have to kind of look at it as, as another piece of the puzzle. Like, you have to train, you have to work out in the gym, you have to diet, and you'll probably also have to get, you know, a side income to be able to do it. And the, instead of looking at it like something that's taking away from from your pursuit, you kind of just have to add it to part of the mix. Um, I, I definitely agree and, and, and agree that I've had to do, you know, lots of different jobs over the course of the many years kind of doing this. So, uh, uh, yeah, I appreciate kind of sharing that insight. That is going to do it for this week's episode, ladies and gents. Uh, thank you once again to Rashida for taking time out of her season to come on and share her story with all of you. It's just it's one of those stories where I feel like it it just kind of helps put things in perspective when you're thinking about how difficult your journey is, or maybe you're in a bit of a down period right now. But just to hear her kind of talk about you know going through so many different injuries and surgeries and setbacks and and not being selected by a team and 
you know, having a contract or what she thought was a contract in Norway and then, you know, turning out to, to not be there. And, and just, I think so many points where you could easily have not blamed somebody for saying, Hey, this is, this is just not for me. I'm going to go and the universe is telling me something. I'm going to go pick another route, but she didn't. So it really just helps you put into perspective, like I said, some of the struggles that you have gone through. Now I asked you at the top and I'm going to ask you in case you didn't at the top one more time quickly here before I wrap up and leave you, uh, YouTube, if you're listening, do me a big favor. You've listened to the whole episode. Now, if you made it this far, I appreciate you. And I want you to do me one more big favor, please just open up your YouTube right now in the 11 podcast, hit that subscribe button as we are trying to really make a push for the visual content as well. So if you could do me that big favor and just subscribe to the YouTube channel as it helps the podcast and it helps the show grow so much. I can't thank you guys enough. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for supporting, subscribing, liking, following all the things that you've done over the course of this podcast. It means the world to me and looking forward to giving you guys more content, more episodes on the way and can't wait to see you again soon. All right, peace.